Imagine if all of LA commuters took a class action suit over traffic. I mean, I was stuck in traffic this morning. It was awful. Oh, is that me? It's my f***ing lawyer. <laughs> Do you want to? See, I heard you want to sue the government. We're gonna talk about this. Totally, totally. Please don't do that, Sam. Hey, I'm Sam Sanders. Thank you for checking out my show, a show all about fun and entertainment. This episode, we are talking climate change. I know, not something most of us think is fun or entertaining at all. But my guest this week is Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson. She's out with a new book on climate change and how to address it. And in this book, she leans into joy and fun and even entertainment to make her case. Her book is called What If We Get It Right? Visions of Climate Futures. And in this book, she writes at length about how climate solutions probably need to include some of the fun stuff I talk about on this show movies and music and TV, and maybe even poetry and magic. Yes, there's poetry in this book. And on our book tour, Dr. Ayana has brought up a magician on stage. All right, Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. Hi. Hello. Tell folks who you are. Um, I'm Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. Should I be looking at a camera? Look at me. Okay, good. And say doctor. Come I on now. Dr. Ayana yes. Elizabeth Johnson. Yeah. Um, I'm a marine biologist by training, but for the last, gosh, almost 20 years, I've been doing um, mostly ocean policy and yeah. climate policy and more and more communications. Okay. And we're here today to talk about, I've got it, your new book. Tell folks what it's called. What If We Get It Right? Visions of Climate Futures. Yeah. A big question mark. A big question mark, because it is. So I want to start by talking about your book event, which I mm. went to this past weekend. Um, I go to a, a lot hoot. of book events. This one was fun. <laughs> was you so called fun. it a climate variety show? It was. There was a lot of variety. Uh, I, I, what made you think of that? I just, well, I didn't want to go on a book tour. It sounded <laughs> well, you're like, on one right now. Like an awful thing to have to do. Yeah, right? and yours has a lot of stops. And mine has 20 cities, like Ooh. over 40 events. Yeah. I'm a masochist. Yeah. Um, but the reason I'm doing that, obviously, is to engage people mm -hmm. in this concept, uh, this discussion of climate solutions, where we can all fit in, mm -hmm. how we can accelerate implementation and mm -hmm. adaptation and resilience, all of this. Um, but I didn't want to do a book tour. And I was like, well, the only way I'm going to do it is if I design it so that it's fun for me. Yeah. Okay. And so the whole vibe is like, let's take climate change seriously. Mm -hmm. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's serious. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to take ourselves seriously. Like that part is optional. Yeah. And I reject it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the variety show. And I want to tell folks checking this show out what kind of variety show it was. I'm going to try to run through it all. You, It called it a climate variety show. There was singing, there were poets, there was magic, uh -huh. there was comedians, a DJ, two puppets? How mm -hmm. many puppets? Two puppets. Two puppets. Yeah. Uh, games, audience there was a interaction. Dance -off. Yeah, I had to miss the dance off. I had oh, to go. you left early. You missed uh, Dance Dance Revolution to Sean Paul's Get Busy. <laughs> <laughs> Ayana versus Jason Sudeikis. Oh, yeah, also, Jason Sudeikis was there. He was my co-host. He co-hosted at the Publication Day event also yeah. in Brooklyn. Yeah. Yeah. So I am, I want to talk about the event because I was thinking, I was like, when is the last time I consumed content, events, book, movie, TV, music, anything about climate change that had any bit of joy in it? Mm. And I said to myself... Fern Gully. And even then, I was worried most of the movie <laughs> yeah. until the end when they saved it. Um, why don't more people, especially more creatives, mm. especially Hollywood, talk about climate change with any other emotion besides despair? Well, first of all, Hollywood barely talks about it at all. Yeah. In something like 30 or 40,000 scripted films and TV series, less than 3% mentioned any climate terms at all. So just 3% mention? Under, like 2.8%. Wow. And so we're just not seeing, I mean, I think part of what you're getting at is like there's a possibility for a broad range of emotions and mm -hmm. approaches. Mm -hmm. And right now we're just, it's just absent. Yeah. Um, 
And obviously, I think that's a missed opportunity. This book has 20 interviews in it at mm-hmm. the heart of it. And one of them is with Franklin Leonard, mm-hmm. the blacklist in Hollywood, who deals with with everything screenwriting. Yeah. Um, and Adam McKay, filmmaker, director, producer. Who made a climate change movie. Who made Don't Look Up, which yeah. is, yeah, a parable for climate change. Um, and I think it was so interesting talking to them because they were like, well, we can't get that stuff greenlit mm. because the executives in Hollywood don't see climate as a big enough problem or as pervasive in pop culture. Mm-hmm. And until they get it, we can't get these things greenlit and the, they won't get it until the news gets it right. Yeah. So Franklin and Adam were like, y'all need to figure out how to get climate reporting right so that the executives are like, oh, we need to address this. Um, and so I actually added an interview to the book with Kendra Pierre-Lewis, this I incredible yeah. climate journalist, um, to help me think through like what it would look like for the news to get it right. And one of her answers is it can't just be like a climate section. Ooh. It has to be in the travel section, mm-hmm. in the auto section, which should actually be a transport section. Oh. Um, in, a, you know, a lot of our geopolitics is driven by droughts and floods and other you know, storms and other climate fueled mm-hmm. disasters um, and food insecurity mm-hmm. and et cetera. People, sort of different communities mashing up together because of um, the effects of climate change. Yeah. So it was very interesting to have them sort of bring it back to me um, in that arc from we can't get it right in Hollywood until we get it right in the news. But I've been thinking more and more coming from a a science background, working in policy, that actually what we need to get it right is in culture. Okay. Because once we have like the cultural awareness and demand, that's what builds political will. That's what builds the demand for Hollywood. I mean, we look to Hollywood and politicians as if they're leaders. They're followers. They're just like, yeah, they're They're, followers. They're They're like reading the tea leaves. Like, what can we make money on or get elected by? Yeah. Well, and then it's like, just as soon as they hear you say the word culture, it's like, oh, it has to be fun, too. There has to be some fun involved. Yeah. So why don't we throw a goofy variety show? I love Um, this. And just try to welcome people in. I mean, that's actually what I think of as my role in the climate movement as like welcomer. Yeah. Like, come on, we need you. Yeah. I want you to talk about one example of getting it right Mm. from this book. Your favorite or your one that you think is the stickiest. There's a lot in here, but which one are you glomming onto right now? Every every time I think about it, something else pops to mind. I'm heading um, later today to San Francisco to do some events with Abigail Dillon, who's the president of Earth Justice. Okay. Um, and Earth Justice, their tagline is because the earth needs a good lawyer. So they're suing corporations, <laughs> they're suing the government yeah. for not adhering to the standards that are set, right? Mm-hmm. The Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the cases that they brought was against the government because the U.S. Postal Service was buying a whole new fleet of trucks and mm-hmm. they weren't going to be electric. Oh. And they were like, we, we reject this. Yeah. We don't think you've done a proper cost benefit analysis yeah. on air quality, on just the cost of the vehicles. Like you're just doing things the same way you've always done it because you're just not thinking through this properly. And they took the government to court and won. Okay. And so now we are about to have the first electric fleet of mail trucks. Can I just stop you and say, as someone who's been obsessed with the postal service and postal workers <laughs> forever, I'm geeking the hell out about Isn't this. Isn't that cool? It's like, be so why cool. not? I had a neighbor when I was in high school who was a postman, Mr. Isaiah. He was just the best guy ever. There you go. Give them electric trucks. Give them. And they're cool looking. They have like a nice big window. Come on. Very nice. And so it's stuff like that. Like how can the court system be mm-hmm. a part of the solution? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, yeah, I asked her like, who do, we mo- who do you most want to sue? She's like, honestly, our right to sue the government is so critical to getting these things done because the government is often not in line with their own laws. Yeah, and it's hard to sue them. It's actually hard to sue them. It's hard to win. It's not hard to sue them. Okay, good to know. Now I'm thinking what I want to sue the government about. (laughs) (laughs) Traffic. Um, I want you to talk about 
something from the book? Well, you actually might be able to sue the government for traffic because they're doing okay. things like building more lanes on highways, which only increases driving mm -hmm. instead of building, say, high speed trains. Mm -hmm. um, and so you could say, like, this is actually not helping with okay. traffic. This is a waste of my taxpayer dollars if the goal is to get from A to B efficiently yeah. and cost effectively. Yeah. I reject that more lanes are the answer. Imagine if all of L.A. commuters took a class action suit over traffic. I mean, I was stuck in traffic this morning. It was awful. Yes. Someone was texting me like, would you move to L.A.? I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> There's a portion of your book in which you talk about how readers and everyday people can begin to make some of this climate work personal mm. and make themselves a part of it in a really real way. It is a Venn diagram of yeah. questions we can ask ourselves. I found it quite interesting. Will you explain it to our sure. audience? Um, yeah, three circles. Yes. The first circle is, what are you good at? Okay. And so the idea is that for so long, at least from what I was seeing in the mainstream media. What does that mean? It's my lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Like, do you want to? See, I heard you want to sue the government. We're gonna talk about this. Totally, yes. totally. Please don't do that, Sam. Okay. All right. We're back. Where were we? The Venn um, diagram. So, I think one of the challenges with the environmental movement, or one of the failings, perhaps, is that so much of the communications has been asking everyone to do the same thing to help. Yes. Reduce, right? reuse, recycle. Reduce, reuse, recycle. And now we know, like, recycling plastic is basically Denmark. nonsense. Yeah. Um, reduce, yes. Reuse, yes. Mm -hmm. Recycle paper and aluminum, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but there's so much more we can do. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the message has been, you know, lower your impact on the planet. So your consumerism, your recycling, et cetera. Um, vote, protest, donate, spread the word. Mm -hmm. um, and that's great. Yeah. I do all those things. Yeah. I encourage everyone to do those things. Um, but that's never going to be enough. Mm. Right. That's sort of the bare minimum. And it's very, for lack of a better word, self-centered. Mm. It's centered on like what you personally are doing inside your own household or maybe just as an individual in mm -hmm. your household, as opposed to how can we contribute to the larger systems changes that need to happen. Right. Because we have to shift from a from a an economy and a society that's deeply entrenched into the fossil fuel infrastructure, yeah. like everything. And entrenched in consumption. And entrenched in consumption, often of fossil fuels. I mean, how much single-use plastic, whether we think about fast fashion or yeah. to-go yeah. convenience stuff, it's yeah. all plastic, which is all fossil fuels, which is part of the fossil fuel industry strategy as we shift to electric energy. They're mm. like, we'll just sell it to you in a different form. Yeah. And this is, is the thing I want to stop here. I never connected the dots about fossil fuels and plastic until I was getting ready for this interview. Petrochemicals. Who? Plastic yeah. is fossil fuel. Plastic. Yeah. Yes. Pla plastic <laughs> is fossil fuel. It's now you great. know. Okay, keep going, sorry. Um, and of course, it's polluting the same communities that have had to deal with refineries, right? We're thinking about Cancer Alley and the Gulf South, mm. all of those communities dealing mm. with that pollution. Um, anyway, so having this very general list of what everyone can do, I think is really missing the opportunity for us all to, to bring our unique skills, resources, networks, superpowers yeah. to climate solutions. So that first circle, what are you good at? Mm -hmm. And then the second circle is what is the work that needs doing? So what are the particular climate and justice solutions you want to contribute to, yeah. right? Obviously, we need to get it right in the news and media. We need to have this storytelling part in films and TV. We need to like physically shift our infrastructure to renewable energy. We need to change public transit. We need to upgrade our food system, mm -hmm. our homes, energy efficiency, mm -hmm. All of it, protect and restore ecosystems. Mm -hmm. Photosynthesis is magic if we could just let more of that yeah. be happening. Yeah. Um, so there's a gazillion things in the what work needs doing category. So pick something. Mm -hmm. And then the third circle is what brings you joy, right? Like okay. this is the work of our lifetimes. Yeah. So if we just pick something that we're really good at and needs doing but makes us miserable, like no one's going to want to work with us. Yeah. We're not going to be building this bigger, stronger team and, yeah. and, and or we're going to burn out. So okay. it's not effective. So figuring out how to be at the heart of that Venn diagram is, I think, where we all need to land. I'm thinking of now what my Venn diagram would be, and I'm realizing I hadn't thought about it before right now, but I'm thinking about it as we're talking about it. We're talking about traffic. 
Mm-hmm. I have to drive from my home in South LA to the studio in Santa Monica. It mm-hmm. sucks. It sucks. And I'm like, all right, what do I like to do? What am I good at? And what can I spread the word about and be joyful about? Running. I could run to work. Oh, my God. I could run to work. <laughs> I could leave clothes here to wear and then uh-huh. take the train back home. And I could talk about it with friends and get some other folks to go to Santa Monica to run with me. Okay. Why not? I mean, I don't know. I'm just like, that sounds like a lot of polluted air you're breathing. I don't know what the route I is. I already run in LA. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm already in it. But I'm just like, okay, this is something I could do yeah. that would feel yeah. good and that I would evangelize. I would talk about it with others. Bring more people in. Yes. I would encourage you to think also about what you can do in your professional life. Yeah. Well, because this that's where you have like the most power, <laughs> yeah. right? The most influence. Yeah. We all do have our sphere of influence with our yeah. friend circle. Um, and I think this conversation, great, but like- Every topic you're going to have a guest on here about connects to climate in some way. You could ask every guest something okay. about that intersection okay. of their work because I think one of the challenges with the media right now is that climate is always like a it's separate siloed. conversation, whereas it's actually related to the election, mm-hmm. as we've talked about, right? It's related to our transportation system, our food system, everything. So I would like up the bar a little bit and think about what you can do in your personal life, but mm-hmm. also what you can do in your professional and civic life yeah. um, as far as contributing to climate solutions. I, like I mean, that. maybe there's something KCRW needs to do to up its game yeah. on sustainability, right? What the hell are y'all doing? I don't know. Maybe yeah. there's a way the institution could lower its carbon footprint or think about showing up in a different way. Or if it's already doing everything right, how can this organization bring other stations along into these best practices? I think that's something I've noticed a lot with corporations who are really leaders on sustainability mm-hmm. is they're like, it doesn't really matter if we're perfect if no one follows our lead. There you go. So that's so important to like yeah. build that team. Yeah. I want to go back to the entertainment industry mm-hmm. and this idea of them never doing it, never mm-hmm. talking about climate change or rarely doing it in a way that works for people. You and Franklin Leonard and mm-hmm. Jason played a wonderful game at yeah. your show this weekend called Blockbuster, but make it climate. Correct. Explain this game. So... The game is um, Jason Sudeikis played the host. Um, we brought Franklin Leonard on stage, who I've known since 1998, freshman year of college. You um, went to school together. Yeah. So oh, he can Franklin. sort of like, we have a comfort level. Yeah. He can make fun of me, basically, <laughs> um, and vice versa. And he knows everything about movies. Like, and I know yeah. nothing about movies. And I know a lot about climate. And yeah. he knows very little about climate. Yeah. And so the idea was between the two of us, we would take suggestions from the audience of blockbuster films Mm -hmm. and brainstorm how to weave in a climate plot or subplot. Yeah. What did y'all come up with on the stage that night? I'm remembering. Um, Something Mean Girls related. Oh, I was like, can she start a climate club at her high school? (laughs) (laughs) Um, which is like most high schools have one now. How come we have nothing like that huh. on TV, right? Huh. Um, or for like rom-coms, why can't we have a meet cute at a composting facility or in a bike lane at a red light when you like look Aww. to the left and you're like, that dude is like yeah. looking very cute today, right? Yeah. Or like a, a family fight at an EV charging station because someone <laughs> didn't plan shit correctly, you know? Like all of this is part of our normal lives now and it's not reflected at all. I mean, the hot solar panel installer, like definitely Come deserves on. a cameo, yeah. right? Um, and then the sort of the last one was someone was like, Titanic. And I was like, well, there's climate change and there's no icebergs. And then they yeah. just live happily ever after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the boat doesn't sink. So yes, a lot of plots could be, I think that's the point is that it doesn't have to just be documentaries about the problem. Yes. It can be solutions woven into, woven into just plots. normal yeah. life that's playing out in sitcoms, in dramas, et yeah. cetera. You and Franklin talked about this, and I had never thought about it before. Um, Black Panther, whether they meant it or not, is kind of a climate change movie. Totally. Because the world of Wakanda that exists in that future, mm-hmm. that Afro future, uh, it is respectful of the planet in ways that our yeah. current one is not. Vibranium. Yeah. Renewable energy. Yeah. High speed trains. Come on. No urban sprawl. Bam. Protecting natural resources and then like city with trolleys yeah. and green buildings. Like that's the opening scene. Yeah. Like fly in over this like herds of wild animals yeah. and lush green rolling hills. 
And it's literally the opposite of LA. <laughs> where you just have like endless housing subdivisions, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that is really interesting. It, the person who pointed that out to me is Kendra Pierre Lewis, again, yeah. this incredible climate journalist who yeah. wrote about that in an essay for All We Can Save, my first book that I co-edited with mm -hmm. Catherine Wilkinson. Um, and I was like, oh, yeah, like that's how you would do yeah. it. And Black no Panther one looks at that. Change movie. Yes, but in all these movies, they're showing us possible futures. Every film we see is depicting a world that we either want or don't want to live in or mm -hmm. elements of. Mm -hmm. um, and I would just love to see more films that show us a future where we get it right to some degree. And yes. I think getting it right doesn't mean a perfect world, right? Yeah. Cl the climate has already changed. Yeah. We're talking here on the heels of one of the largest hurricanes to ever hit mm -hmm. the Southeast United States, mm -hmm. to hit hundreds of miles in. I mean, flooding in Atlanta of like- Flooding in Asheville, North Carolina. Has never Wild. happened before in Atlanta yeah. like this, right? We are seeing completely unprecedented, extremely dangerous, long recovery time, impacts mm -hmm. of climate. Yeah. Um, and we're not dealing with this in popular culture. Yeah. It's just like we just move on. We move on. Or we love to make films that only talk about an incredibly dystopian future. Right. I love the Mad Max films. And every single one of them imagines a world in which there ain't no more water and we are all in trouble. Mm -hmm. Hollywood loves to do that. Yeah. Less so loves to do things where we get it right. I mean, you aren't a psychologist or psychiatrist, but what do you think that's about? I often about? wished that I had studied that in college instead because uh. so much about climate solutions, like, first of all, we have the solutions we need. They're there. Like, yeah. we already know how to do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's no secret mm -hmm. how to move off of fossil fuels mm -hmm. um, and protect and restore nature, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Like, we know. It's a matter of motivation for implementation. Yeah. Right. How quickly, how yeah. justly can we deploy these solutions mm -hmm. um, and at what scale? And that's a question of like, are you inspired? Yeah. Are people who have the money and the power inspired mm -hmm. and motivated? Are we excited about this? I think so. I think so often about like, how do people's minds work? How do they decide what to prioritize, what to spend time on? And how do um, we decide what to think about with fear or what to think about with love or humor or optimism? Mm -hmm. Like, what is it about human psychology that as soon as we're faced with the idea of climate change, most of us default to whew, doom, gloom, that's it. I think it's not even just that we default to doom and gloom. We often people default to giving up. Yeah. Because it seems so big and so hard. Yeah. And like that's that is the purpose of this book okay. to say, like, we don't get to quit. <laughs> you don't get to give up on life on Earth. Right. Like, yeah. that's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, there's somewhere in the book where I forget who you're interviewing, but your guest was like all these billionaires saying they're going to move to Mars. They won't even go to the Bronx. I mean, you ain't going to Mars. We're here. We're, we're here. here. This is, in fact, the best planet. As Dr. K. Marvel, <laughs> NASA climate scientist, has decreed. I agree with her. And so we're going to have to figure it out here. And yeah. so we should just start figuring it out, right? Because it's a matter of not apocalypse or paradise, but literally anything in between. Yes. And so I think the question is, how can we each help to be a part of getting us as close mm -hmm. to paradise as possible, the best possible climate future, even knowing that it's not going to be a perfect one. That spectrum is the difference between, you know, five horrible storms a year and 10 horrible mm -hmm. storms a year when you live, between a hundred million people having to move and a billion people having to move, right? Mm -hmm. These are the, it, these differences in temperature rise have huge implications mm -hmm. for all of our lives, for our food security, for our health, for our well-being, for culture, yeah. for jobs, all of it. And yeah. so we like ignoring it doesn't make it go away. It just makes it less and less likely that we'll get the get best possible done. future. Yeah. There's a line in your book that I was thinking of as I was seeing you do these motions of, mm -hmm. you know, the gradations. You say you're not in it for the glory, you're in it for the ripples. Mm -hmm. Explain that. I love that. Yeah, that comes out of, it's a lesson that I learned from watching my dad's career. My dad, mm. um, a Jamaican immigrant to New York City in the 60s, became an architect, um, co-founded one of the first black firms in New York City, architecture, a notoriously racist insular and, and white. insular white field. Yeah. 
um, really hard to get a breakthrough to like build the building of mm-hmm. your dreams. And so he ended up doing mostly small projects for the city, working on, um, you know, for the sanitation department mm-hmm. or renovating a fire station or a, an old folks home, right? These projects that you don't like brag about yeah. and have your name on. Yeah. Um, and so I thought he was a failure and he never made any money, you know, mm. it's just like a few small projects. They take forever to pay mm-hmm. you. It's just miserable. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't get it until I met an architect, a black architect, a generation, his junior mm-hmm. at a cocktail party a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, my dad was an architect too. And he was like, oh, tell me about him. What did he work on? And I told, told him the story and he said, I've heard of that firm, you know, they opened a lot of doors. For people, for the rest of us, yeah, and I absolutely teared up. Yeah, right? I am almost about to as well. That's because beautiful. That's the whole point. Like someone has to go first. Someone yes. has to be the trailblazer, and they might not see the glory. And you don't get the glory, and that doesn't matter. Like he was successful because he did what he set out to do, which was like there you go. pave the way uh, for others. And I think so much of what I hope this book will do, or perhaps my work more broadly is just call them ripples or seeds. Just get these ideas out into the world, primarily that we have the solutions we need and that we need everyone to help us make them happen in the world. And to me, the sexiest word of all is implementation. Okay. Right. So like, how can we all be part of like making these things really happen in the world? You can be a ripple. Yeah. The glory is secondary. I mean, and also not that useful and distracting yeah. and all of that sort of like yeah. celebrity influencer culture yeah. stuff. I just want everyone to feel like wherever they are, what they do yeah. matters and to just think bigger and bigger and like yeah. welcome and welcome. Yeah. Well, and this is one of those challenges where it's not like running a marathon or fighting a war. You don't say it's over now and we did it. Right. No. There may never be. Uh, we I can fix promise climate you change in your lifetime day. that will never happen. happen. Yeah. Doesn't mean we still can't work towards it. Yeah. Absolutely. I love this. I've been thinking actually a lot about the civil rights movement in this regard, mm. right? Like there's no guarantee of the Civil Rights Act of any sort of future equality, right? Like mm-hmm. the odds were long. Oh, yeah. And the fight was hard and it was dangerous. Yeah. And all of these things. And the line that comes back to me is Martin Luther King saying, I may not get there with you. That. That. that doesn't mean you get to just be like, well, if I'm not going to see the victory, yeah. then like, why bother? Yeah. Yeah. Someone's going <laughs> to yeah. get there. And so I guess I'm not an optimist. People see the book title and they yeah. think it's hopeful. Yeah. They assume I'm an optimist. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm a scientist. I've seen the projections. I know this could go terribly wrong. Yeah. That is very much an option. Yeah. It already is terribly wrong in so many ways. Right. I mean, L.A., the fires, the floods, the coastal erosion, the houses falling into the ocean, like it's here. Yeah. And so the question is, is, is not like, will we like the, the book title is not this is how we get it right. It's when like, we get it right. Yeah. It's like, what if? What if? Because it's if not we guaranteed. Tried, yeah. You know, um, and I think that's to me a relief. I don't have to be optimistic. I don't mm. have to be hopeful. Mm. You just... Do it anyway, because it's the right thing to do. And it's the direction we want to be in. And we want to be on the right side of history. And like this aligns with our values. Um, And I think it's a load off for me to not have to be hopeful, to not have to be optimistic, but just to show up and try to be useful, Mm -hmm. just be useful. It reminds me of some good advice someone gave me years ago. And they said to me, there's actually no difference between the way bravery feels and the way fear feels. Mm. With both of them, you're scared. Mm-hmm. The thing about bravery is you just do something anyway. Mm-hmm. And so you don't have to wait to feel optimistic. You don't have to wait to feel no fear. Mm-hmm. You don't have to wait to see a finish line. Ripple now. Yeah. Ripple now. Yeah. I was talking to... Um, NASA climate scientist, Dr. Kate Marvel, the other yeah. day. Great last and name, she was, by the way. I know. <laughs> MarvelClimate.com is her Come website on. in case you want to read her scientific papers. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and she was saying, like, this whole optimism thing. She was like, I kind of don't get it. Like, I don't feel optimistic about paying my taxes. <laughs> but, like, it's just something you do. do it. Right? Yeah. I don't feel optimistic about dinner. And so if I don't feel optimistic, I don't, like, buy groceries. It's like, yeah. you just, like, do the things. Yes. And then... Yeah. And you you can do do a lot of things in a lot of different emotional states. Totally. And the only emotion is not optimism. 
Mm -hmm. Like in the emotions that feel bad are also there too and good too. Some people are actually very motivated by the fear stuff, like the fire and brimstone stuff, right? Like David Wallace Wells' book, The Uninhabitable Earth, Mm -hmm. got a lot of people off their butts and into the work, right? So I think this whole hope versus fear thing is a sort of useless false dichotomy. Yes. And the thing that we need is actually just more people talking about it with the yeah. full range of human emotions instead of arguing about like which is the right emotion. It's like yeah. we're each going to respond yeah. to different Also, things. have you seen Inside Out, people? All of your oh. emotions are trying to help you in their own special way. Thank you. Yes. Come on. All right. It's time for a break. Will you stick with us? We have some questions from listeners Ooh. for a climate scientist Absolutely. like yourself. Okay. All right. We're back. On the show with my favorite climate thinker, Dr. Ayanna <laughs> Elizabeth Johnson. I mean, you oh, are. I'm honored. You are. <laughs> Dr. Like, Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson. How many climate do you have? Um, I want to briefly ask you some questions that people sent in sure. to me and to you over the weekend. Because I said on my socials, I'm going to be talking to Dr. Ayanna about climate change and just how to just deal with it inside of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And... People love you, and they love being able to ask someone smart questions on this theme. So can I give you a few? All right. All I'm right. ready. One that I got several times over from all kinds of people was, how should I talk to kids mm. about the climate crisis? That's a sweet question. And I so I'm actually writing a children's book next love. because I feel like this is so important for parents, yeah. almost more so than for children, yeah. to help parents figure out ways to broach this. Because kids know what's going on. They hear it. Mm -hmm. In kindergarten, they -hmm. know, like, something's wrong. People are talking about climate change. Like, it sounds bad. Yeah. Um, And... In the same way that kids notice race before you talk to kids about race. Yeah. They're They're seeing it. Yeah. Absolutely. And gender and all of it. Right? Yes. These little sponges out there in the Mm -hmm. world. And I think about when I was a kid hearing about save the whales or Mm -hmm. the forests. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why would anyone be hurting whales and forests? That seems like wrong. Yeah. And that that sense of moral clarity that young people have, I think, is so critical to this work, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, When we think about the youth climate movement, really Mm -hmm. holding adults to task and saying, you're setting our our future on fire. Mm -hmm. Please cut it out. Like yeah. it's it's our future yeah. that's at risk here. Um, so I do think anything we can do to help young people um, feel understood, be be leaders in their own way at their at whatever age is very helpful to all of us. Mm-hmm. We have this what should be a more deeply intergenerational movement now, right? We basically have four generations of people yeah. working on this together yeah. at the same time, which is phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, some of the activists I hang out with are like definitely in their 70s and 80s and then there's the teens too. Um and I guess I would say As, as goes with a lot of communication with kids is like asking them what they know, mm. making sure we're giving them the chance to ask their questions. Mm-hmm. Often when I'm hanging out with kids, I say like, let's look into that together. Mm. Let's explore that together. Um, and to never, ever talk about the problems without also talking about the solutions. Because again, we have the solutions we need. And there are ways for even young people to be a part of that Mm-hmm. in these various ways. I know when I was a kid, I was like, obviously we're recycling, mom and dad, like get it together. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, you're smoking cigarettes. We're all clear that this is very bad for you. You have to stop. You're going to die seven years earlier and yeah. leave me all alone. Yeah. And like, do you not love me? Aww. Right? And there's a thing that kids do in their families. Kids now are like the reasons a lot of families are getting electric cars because their kids are huh. like, duh, why would you buy something with an internal combustion engine? hmm just yeah. a terrible idea that's so retrograde, Yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think kids are very influential now. It's yeah. not just like when they grow up. Yeah, yeah. On the theme of kids, um, I've heard this type of conversation in other interviews you've done. Mm. When people are asked or when you ask people, like, why do you care about climate change and getting this right? Mm-hmm. A lot of folks with kids will say, well, it's for my children. Mm-hmm. And I hear it. And at first, I want to be like, yeah, cool. But where does that leave people with no children? Mm -hmm. Where does that leave me, you? Mm -hmm. 
I don't want to say that that answer is selfish, but it feels myopic. And I wonder, like, yeah. what is the parallel for that for people who don't have kids? It There's a few things that I think are challenging about that mindset. One is if you didn't have, have children, you wouldn't care. Right. The other is it's centered solely on your own family, not like the children of the mm. world. I care about kids, even though I don't have any personally. Yeah. Right. And then it also assumes that the climate crisis is a problem for the future. It's a problem right now. And it's a problem right now. Um, but if that is what motivates someone to yeah. roll up their sleeves yeah. and get to work, I embrace it. Okay. Right? Okay. Um, because the truth is that love for future generations is actually the biggest motivator for yeah. climate action. 12 times bigger than like green jobs or financial huh. security. So that is what it is, Sam. Yeah. And so I think we just harness that. Like yes. if that's what's motivating you, great. Do it, yeah. Um, and I, I love that it's framed as protecting future generations yeah. as opposed to like only your only own children. Well, and I, I, I was mulling this over on the ride over here this morning because yeah. I was like, I really get irrationally pee when people say I care about climate because of my kids. And it's like, well, if I don't have that, what is it for me? And I mm -hmm. think it's like what I want when I think of future generations. I think a lot about what allows people to be in the space to make art mm. and how and because I want to consume it and I always want it there. Mm -hmm. And there's there's this narrative that people make great art when they're in distress. But in actuality, people make great art when they are at ease, mm -hmm. when they have time, when they have space and when they feel safe and loved by where they are. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, I get it. What I want for the future generations, anyone's kids is a world that is hospitable enough to them to allow them to make beautiful things. Oh, yes, please. Right? Uh-huh. I don't want a Mad Max dystopian future where the kids can't just sit and strum their guitar for 12 hours. Mm -hmm. I want not a Garden of Eden, but, but I want... But why not? But why not, right? <laughs> I want people While we're hoping and, to have and dreaming. Yeah, the ease and the comfort and the leisure enough mm -hmm. to create art, which is what humanity is all about for me. Yeah. Because there is enough for everyone. Mm -hmm. Like there is a role for everyone. There's a place for everyone. Mm -hmm. Like often I think so much of the problem that we're in comes down to the fact that some people do not like to share. Scarcity mindset. Not only that, but just greed of, you know, fossil fuel executives for one. Yeah. Like y'all have known since the 70s, your own scientists, mm -hmm. Exxon, have told us mm -hmm. that burning fossil fuels will release greenhouse gases that will blanket the earth, warm it, and yeah. lead to chaos. Yeah. Um, and you're like, nope, we're just going to keep doing it anyway. Right. Yeah. That's that disregard for the future, mm -hmm. I find to be infuriating mm -hmm. and heartbreaking. And the way that I found the words for inverting that in this book, as you know, there's lots of what if questions mm -hmm. throughout. And the question I love the most is, what if we act as if we love the future? Say that again. What if we act as if we love the future? Look at this Super Soul Sunday conversation. I know. I love it. Um, because that's just a totally different mindset, right? And what if climate solutions are beautiful? Mm. Like we get the chance to literally design the world mm. that we want to live in. Make it pretty. And something like 75% of the infrastructure that will exist in 2050, 25 years from now, yeah. doesn't exist today. Huh. We are literally building and rebuilding the world all the time. What if we just made it nice? You know, um, that's an option for us. I love this. Like, You're saying this We could replenish. Angeles. We could regreen, yeah. right? We could invert things in all these ways. Yeah. I hear you saying this in Los Angeles right now, a city that doesn't know how to build things pretty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, hope. this is what happens when I'm, I'm like raised by an architect and an English teacher. I'm like, what are the ways yes. that we could understand the yes. world and create the world? Yeah. Um, and yeah. design things that are both beautiful and will last. Yeah, yeah. I want to get another question from uh, the yes, audience. Please. This one came up a lot as well, and I'm guessing you get it a lot, mm -hmm. but it's always worth explaining. Does recycling actually work? It depends on what the thing is. Okay. okay. So aluminum cans, please never, ever, ever throw out an aluminum can. Recycle. Take, yeah, always recycle them. Okay. I, if I have an aluminum can, I will carry it around until I find a recycling bin. Okay. Because they take, it takes a lot of energy to mine the metal 
mm-hmm. to make it into the shape of a can, mm-hmm. to ship it wherever. Um, and aluminum can actually be recycled indefinitely. You melt oh. it down, you make a new can. It actually has this okay. circularity to it. Whereas plastic, in the best possible scenario, you can recycle once or twice. Mm. Um, what and, about glass? And plastic, I think it's important to say, those numbers on the bottom with the three arrows, that is not actually a recycling symbol. That is greenwashing from the plastics industry. All it means is what number, what type of plastic it is, which has associated with it levels of recyclability. But that does not mean it's actually recyclable because probably like... Probably it's not. It's not. Really? Now, what about glass? Glass takes a lot of energy to melt down. Gotcha. So it's it's recyclable, but it's also more energy intensive than aluminum okay. or paper. Paper we should definitely be recycling as okay. well. But I think the thing that people miss about this reduce, reuse, recycle thing is that there's other R's that we oh. should be thinking about. A, we don't think enough about reduce. We skip yeah. straight to recycle. Yeah. We skip reduce and reuse, but really reduce, 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 and then reuse, recycle. Like, okay. do you even need that thing? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and then also repair. Like, okay. like the, one of my dreams for the future is every neighborhood has a repair shop. You're like, my blender's broken. Mm. My whatever is broken. Help me fix it so I don't buy a new one. My mm-hmm. toaster needs a new whatever. Mm-hmm. This cord on this lamp is frayed and I don't know how to fix it. Yeah. My dog chewed through it. Yeah. What do I do? Or... My clothes have a hole in them. Fix it. Mending. So I don't buy more fast fashion. Exactly. Yeah. The average piece of fast fashion is worn only seven times before it is thrown in the trash. Yeah. A lot of folks asked about this. Fuel efficient car, hybrid car, electric car, or just keep driving the one I already have. How do you make the decision about the right vehicle for you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, The first thing, which I feel obliged to say, is everyone having their own vehicle is not the answer. We need better public transit systems. Um, If you need a car, I get it. A lot (laughs) of places in the U.S. are just not set up for getting around without a car. Um, If you're buying a new – if you do not currently have a car and you're Mm -hmm. buying a car, please buy an electric car. Okay. Um, If you already have a car, the math gets – as your listener was suggesting, a little bit more complicated in the trade-offs because obviously it takes a lot of energy to make the physical car. Um, To mine for the battery even. And, well, either car. Any car takes a lot of energy to make. And so if you have an existing frame of a car, a lot went into that. Um, And so getting a new car has just the manufacturing of the car part Mm -hmm. is a significant part. But the fossil fuel use over the lifetime of the car is the the biggest deal. Mm-hmm. And so it really does matter to switch to electric. I, but the catch there is, where is that electricity coming from? So if you have solar panels on your roof, mm. no brainer. Mm. If you're connecting to the grid that's powered by coal, not ideal. Uh, but yeah. the, but the, so you can still have an electric car that's powered by coal. You could. Huh. But the ideal is that we are all transitioning to renewables. So even if... Your electricity grid is powered right now by natural gas, say, we're putting in solar at an incredible rate that no one expected. Mm -hmm. And the same with wind. And so as the grid gets cleaner, Mm -hmm. the impact of our cars will also get cleaner if they're electric. So because we have cars for more than a year, (laughs) because that transition is happening, everyone should really be buying electric now. Yeah. One more from our listeners, and then we're going to have a short reading before I let you go. Mm -hmm. A few people ask different questions about the politics around climate change at the moment, but I want to make it all one big question and ask you to place this current political moment on climate in a historical context. Mm -hmm. I want to say it feels like it's worse than it's ever been. You've talked about this, like in the 80s and 90s, Democrats and Republicans were coming together on climate change. We're not doing that right now. Mm -mm. How bad is this political moment for climate change in some kind of historical context? Yeah. Okay. I mean, in a historical context, the Environmental Protection Agency Mm -hmm. was established under President Reagan. People forget that. That's when a bipartisan Congress passed the Clean Air Act, Mm -hmm. Clean Water Act. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that we could pass those things today. We barely pass budget approvals to keep the government open. 
um, you know, it was in the early 2000s that you had Newt Gingrich and Nancy Pelosi sitting on a couch together being like, we need climate policy in America. I got to find that video. Can we it add it in post? so weird. They're literally sitting on a couch in front of the Capitol, like a love seat together, being like, totally agree with you, Newt. <laughs> this would never happen today. Yeah. It all started with the Tea Party, like making climate into a partisan issue mm -hmm. and now the the most frustrating thing is most republicans in congress actually know they in know. their heads they know that it's real they know that it's a problem they know it's affecting their constituents but they also know that it's very hard to get elected running on any semblance of even acknowledging mm -hmm. the threats of climate change mm -hmm. um and so that makes it basically impossible to get anything done in Congress and the way that the Inflation Reduction Act got passed, which was the largest ever investment in climate solutions of any government mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. um, the way that got passed is like rebranding it as the infl like rebranding Build reduction. Back Better as the Inflation Reduction Act and really focusing it on jobs and manufacturing and tax credits for homeowners. Mm -hmm. um, things like the American Climate Corps, which is envisioned to put tens of thousands of young people to work, um, they stripped all the funding from that at the last moment, which seems like green jobs for young people, like Congress. reducing wildfire risk, replanting wetlands, giving these kids something solar, to do, giving kids like something extremely useful yes. to do and paying them yes. for it, helping them get their first jobs out of college or high school, et cetera. So valuable. And so the Biden Harris administration had to like bootstrap this out mm. of existing government programs. My friend Maggie Thomas led the charge in the White House to get this to happen. Okay. And it launched last year um, or this year, and they've already hired 15,000 young people doing these green jobs. I love it. Like that's what happens when you get an administration in place that actually is prioritizing the solutions. Whereas you had President Trump take Rolling the U U.S. out of the U.N. climate agreement. Mm -hmm. Strip the EPA. Roll back over 100 environmental regulations. We're talking like who needs clean air and clean water and safe mm -hmm. health, health and safety. Mm -hmm. um, and... That's just at the federal level, right? Yeah. I think I think the choice is very clear <laughs> at the federal level yeah. um, that if you care about climate at all, you should be supporting Kamala Harris, this vote climate mentality. Yeah. But I think we often miss the critical importance of down ballot elections. Yes. It is our city council. It yes. is our mayors. It is our public utility commissions, yes. our port commissioners who are deciding so much about this implementation at a local level. Do we have bike lanes that are good? Do we have municipal composting? Are we updating our building codes for energy efficiency? Mm -hmm. Right. Like that's the people who you're electing at the bottom of the ticket. And so I'd encourage everyone to really think about the climate platforms of these local elections as being really important. Yeah, I love that. This has, and this happens whenever I talk with you, um, I feel a little lighter afterwards, a okay. little more optimistic afterwards. So I I'll appreciate you for that. All right, uh, before we close, I want you to read a bit from your book. Okay, this is um, a little bit from the introduction to little snippets here. If we're honest, Maybe we doubt that humanity actually can get it together, can rally the depth of motivation and creativity required to face this unprecedentedly gargantuan challenge. Mm. But one thing is certain. Half-assed action in the face of potential doom is an indisputably absurd choice, especially given that we already have most of the climate solutions we need, heaps of them. Moving forward requires that we propel each other, propel our species out of a phenomenally entrenched procrastination. Mm. We don't need more data or a more rigorous cost-benefit analysis. We need to leap. But I get it. For decades, what scientists, writers, filmmakers, and artists have projected for us is the apocalypse mm -hmm. in great detail. We can easily picture the climate change-fueled Floods, fires, droughts, and storms, and the immense suffering, all of which are now well underway. However, when it comes to better outcomes, we've largely been left hanging. That is a problem. 
humans have evolved to not leap into a void. Mm. That's dangerous. Mm. So we need something firm to aim for, something with love and joy in it. And we need the gumption that emerges from an effervescent sense of possibility. We find ourselves in a time of reckoning at an inflection point for humanity. What we will inflect toward is not clear. It has not yet been determined how much global temperature will increase, how much sea levels will rise, how we will adapt to the inevitable and prevent the worst, or how we will treat each other amidst it all. Set aside your resignation and nihilism. There is a wide range of possible futures. Peril and possibility coexist. A few things I feel clear about this world we must build together. There can be enough for each of us. There can be a home for each of us. Mm. There can be a role for each of us. The imperative is transformation and the goal is to thrive. Even if that's all we know for sure, it's enough to get started. Now, will we get it right? Mm. I have no idea. It's a long shot, but we could. Dr. Ayana. I'm so grateful for you. Oh, I'm likewise, you. Sam. I'm glad to know you. This was a delight. Um, thank you. Come back. I'd love to. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.